Welcome, everyone. This is MSO News Sports, and we are joined by Essex County District Attorney Paul Tucker. DA, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me back again. Absolutely. No, it's always great talking with you. Um, you know, I reached out a couple of weeks ago, and at that time, there was all kinds of news regarding anti-Semitism, pro-Hamas demonstrations at colleges and a variety of different things. I'd also heard that there was some issues in our area schools, um, nothing specific, but a statewide kind of issue, not necessarily at all uh, information related to the North Shore. But I really felt that it would uh, that we'd I'd like to get you on. And then right at that same time, I heard you were speaking at an event directed at anti-Semitism in Swampscott or Marblehead. So from the DA's office in Essex County, give us your take on what we're seeing with this really kind of unprecedented level of anti-Semitism, and at least in our lifetimes, I believe. Yeah, I agree, Bill. And unprecedented is the right word. If you take a look at the uh, statistics of these anti-Semitic incidents, um, they are off the charts, numbers-wise. Um, we do a pretty good job in, in policing, in tracking the data. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, they also do an incredibly good job of tracking these incidents as well. And if you take a look at this, the, the increase uh, over the last year has been staggering. And particularly since uh, October 7th, the Hamas attack, um, those incidents are up 44%. We're up somewhere around 200% over the last few years. These numbers have never been this high. And I think it's important to note that behind every one of those reported incidents are people. There's people that are suffering. There are people that, have, that, are, that are worried for their safety. We've seen it across Essex County, the state. We've seen it on college campuses. Um, and this really is something that I think everyone has, has a role to play. I, I, I saw a great quote Recently, it said that anti-Semitism is not a Jewish problem any more than hate directed at any group is their problem. It's an American problem, and we need to fix it. The, the thing that struck me, too, and you, you mentioned the safety piece, is the safety piece. And that reality is, is that students are not feeling safe, uh, at least at some of these colleges. And I would think then that, you know, you can have different political views, but when you infringe on someone's safety you know, whatever that form that would take, I mean, that becomes very serious and it becomes something, again, unprecedented, I believe, in, in recent, in, in many years. I agree. And, and while the law may protect certain things like freedom of speech, it doesn't protect all speech. It may right. protect some protests, but not all protests. And I saw firsthand a couple of weekends ago at the Jewish Community Center in Marblehead, um, there was a, a group that came in specifically to talk to young men and women, uh, mostly of high school and early college. And some of the feelings that, that the students described were just horrifying. And uh, the adults sat in the second half of the room. So it was really to listen to the students. It was a moderated talk. And I came away from that, number one, extremely concerned about our young people. Uh, the Jewish students on campus are not feeling safe. And, and unfortunately, we've seen the incidents that are taking place. Um, these are not unreasonable fears that they have. This is, this is an unprecedented time. And I would add, Bill, it's all forms of hate. In Salem, uh, we had a terrible incident last month where somebody drove from Oklahoma to lit a pipe bomb uh, on, the, on the porch of the Satanic Temple on Bridge Street in Salem. This person came all the way from Oklahoma to do this. Fortunately, there was really good work by our local detectives and the, and the FBI, and they were able to arrest that person in Oklahoma. But I just use that um, as just one example of what we are seeing. So these fears are real. Yeah, and I, this may be an impossible question for you to answer, but you know, this, you again mentioned that the October 7 attack uh, was a trigger, but yet, it does seem interesting that all this could have all been bubbling underneath and exploded after the October 7 attack. It just, I'm, I'm hard, I'm, I'm struggling to try to put this together, I guess. Yeah, we were seeing the increases prior to October 7th. We were seeing them, and, and you're right, it might have been just under the surface, but clearly the numbers of incidents of hate crimes, anti Semitism, um, they were trending upward. After October 7th, um, it, it, it just zoomed. Uh, 
Uh, the numbers are just staggering. That's the best way I can say it. And just terrible, terrible incidents where, where folks are not feeling safe. It's unsettled. And, you know, there's a lot going on in the world. And sometimes there's a tendency for people to say, well, these things happen other places. Well, they don't. Sometimes they happen right here in Essex County. We saw that with the Salem incident. These things do happen here. And that's why we have to plan to have something in place should something happen. All right. Another area that I know you're working on and have been working on as a state rep, you worked on juvenile justice reform uh, as a police chief and police officer. You, you worked in uh, in the justice system as well at that end. So now as district attorney, I know you're concerned with uh, the recent violence. When I say recent in the past year on the North Shore and, of course, looking forward to the summertime when the, the weather turns hot and sometimes the violence gets a little hot as well. Yeah, so at the State House, when I was a state rep for the eight years representing Salem, I had the good fortune to work on a lot of the issues surrounding juvenile, juvenile crime, juvenile diversion. I co chaired with Senator Cynthia Cream uh, something called the Emerging Adults Task Force. And what we wanted to do was find best practices of how we deal with juveniles. You know, the, the, the development of, of juveniles and the development of the brain science that has come with it, um, these are not just small adults that we're dealing with. These are juveniles. And one of the important things that, that I look at from my perspective here at the DA's office is what's the best outcome for these juveniles? Sometimes they do something that's so egregious, they have to face a serious consequence. We've seen young kids involved in gun violence. We've seen gang violence with 14, 15, 16 year olds. And frankly, there's a consequence that they have to pay for it. But they also have to make sure, and we need to make sure, the court system, probation, that we're doing the best we can for these young people. There are also a number of people who are getting involved in what I would I just describe as juvenile type behavior, criminal mischief, crimes on the lower end, such as misdemeanors. The longer that we can keep those individuals out of the system, every, every data point will show the longer we keep somebody out, the better chance that they'll never become justice involved. So to that end, uh, we, we took over here uh, in January of 2023, and John Blodgett, my predecessor, had a tremendous juvenile diversion program. And, and John was really on the cutting edge of a lot of, of juvenile programs. Um, we've taken that, and I like to think that we've even taken a little bit further. We're, we're developing something called restorative justice, which in a nutshell, gets offenders, particularly young offenders, together with the person to whom they cause some harm. And it's been proven the success rate of, of this restorative justice model has been excellent. Now, you can't use it for every crime. We wouldn't want to use it for some type of violent assault or anything. These are crimes, let's, for instance, somebody causes damage to somebody else's property. And oftentimes, these property owners do not want to press charges, but they generally also say, they think the person, this in this case, the juveniles, they've got to face some type of, of consequence. And the restorative justice really seems to be a good way to, to bring that forward. We're, we're very blessed in Massachusetts. Right now, uh, Supreme Judicial Court, uh, Chief Justice, Chief Justice Budd, has made restorative justice a cornerstone of her vision as well. So I really think these things are coming together. You know, I, I, I want to ask you about some things that you're doing on the North Shore, but it, it reminds me, and I really hadn't thought of it in these terms before, but when I was in education working with a lot of at-risk at students, there was a thing called the asset model where it was a list of assets that if students had these assets in their lives, different positive things in their lives, they would be better off with that. And I think what you're talking about with this is that students that somehow get into the juvenile justice system you know they need a they need a hand out if you will and and some of some of these um influences and moments in their lives to draw them out authentically uh you know i i think to put them in a better better frame of mind if, if anything else yeah precisely right bill very well said you know I, I i saw somebody speak a couple of weeks ago and he said something that that really uh struck me he said, talent is distributed evenly, but opportunity is not. And I right. think what happens is we've got a lot of, of uh, young adults and emerging adults that don't have the same opportunity or, frankly, privilege that others do. And unfortunately, there's a disparate outcome. These are some of the things we are trying to, we're trying to close that gap to give people 
the opportunity to succeed. And every model shows that if we can keep somebody out of the system up until 18, 19, 20, chances are that they will never reoffend. The, to close the loop on that piece, the other part that always stays with me is the best that we can do for these folks really helps public safety and society. You know, I, I, Kevin Burke, who was DA prior to John Blodgett, another terrific district attorney, was very fond of saying that better outcomes for offenders are better outcomes for society and public safety. And he's exactly right. But let's face it, in the, in the Department of Correction system, in the adult system, 90 plus percent of, of these people that are, that are incarcerated and justice involved, someday will be back on the street. The best that we can do is prepare them for that re-entry. Right. Tell, tell me about some of the programs your office has been running for youth here on the North Shore and Merrimack Valley or whatever in Essex yeah. County. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, Bill. This is something that was important to me uh, when I came into this job. And that's really to see the district attorney's office, not simply as prosecutors, but as a community resource. And to that end, I've worked really closely with uh, Lynn Mayer Nicholson, uh, Chief Chris Reddy, and we've done some programs in Lynn during the February vacation and April vacation. Uh, we brought sports teams in. Uh, we ran incredibly successful flag football. Uh, right now, we started with Lisa Narek of, of the uh, Park and Rec Department in Lynn. She's been a great partner to us. Um, we're doing swim lessons for kids that don't know how to swim. We've seen way too many accidents and incidents where young people you know, get into a situation and they find themselves and can't get out of it. We've seen so many drownings or near drownings. So we thought this was a, a, an issue. So we're sponsoring a series of swim lessons. Up in Lawrence, we've done the same thing. We, had a, we did a really good program at some of the schools in, in Lawrence called Change the Play, where we had a, a disc jockey come in and he did it through music, entrepreneurship, um, getting kids to think about careers, um, art projects, all under the auspices of this change to play. It has been phenomenally successful. Um, we, we sponsor up in Gloucester. We'll be doing it again. I just sent some resources up to them. Uh, Gloucester Police Department, they have a great group of school resource officers. They have a program called the Youth Angler Program. They take a half a dozen kids at a time out on the police boat fishing. And it's more than fishing. It's bonding with police officers. It's getting to know the kids. Tremendous programs. We're heavily involved in all of these. And, and I'm really proud of the work that our office is doing. Well, sign me up for that fishing trip if you could. You know, that I, sounds I, like a good I, time. I, I yeah. did go out and I caught my first bass last year with, with the group. It was a lot of fun. That's nice. But finally, I guess, Paul, um, you know, what what else can you share with us on, on the juvenile justice side of thing? I think that's uh, it's often a very first and foremost kind of topic, I would think. Um, and again, as you were kind of alluding to, you probably covered a lot of this, but your role as a police chief, police officer, and of course the legislature and so on. What's next? What What do you see happening? Is there, are you kind of can foresee things a little bit. Are Are we where we need to be, you know, in the county at this point or where, where can we move forward at? If you will. That's a really good question, Bill. And I would say that it, I think a, a two-part answer is, is, is the best way here. One is we're in a very good place and, and much better than we were, but we still have a lot of work to do. I'll tell you what I worry about a lot is something that we're seeing uh, with, with these emerging adults and mental health. Um, we have partnered with different agencies. We're up in Merrimack Valley with the Merrimack Valley Family Services. Our juvenile diversion program, every young person who comes through it, there's a mental health evaluation and counseling piece, no matter what offense that they were that they were looking at uh, in terms of becoming justice involved or not. So I think mental health is, is an incredibly important piece. I worry that we still haven't seen the, the, the tip of the tidal wave post COVID. I think that our schools, particularly our public schools have done a phenomenal job. Our public school teachers by oftentimes by default, working on the front lines have become so much more than simply just classroom educators. That they're really looking at educating the whole person. We are partnering with, with educators across the community. Um, this, I think, is something that if we don't get a hold on it, these are something that's going to keep continuing to cause us issues for many years to come. We've got to stop this tide. Um, one example, Bill, um, up in Lawrence this past September, we had a 14-year-old uh, young person 
shot and killed a 19 year old woman. And what we looked into to find out good family, hard, hard working family, but this young man was coming home at the end of the day, uh, didn't have anybody else there, became gang involved and gangs are very good at finding these kids and grooming these kids. We need to make sure we're identifying all of those kids before something happens. And I think we really need a proactive approach. And my office is all in on doing it. And I'll just close with, with one thought here is that, you know, when you, if you build a school building and brand new building, it's there and it's there for, for 10 years and it's still going to be in great shape. You're, this kind of work requires ongoing work day after day after day. And then you adjust it and you're always changing it to adapt to what your real needs are. It, it's, it's almost never ending, but that's okay. But that's, that's the nature of the work that you're kind of describing, a never ending kind of work, really. Yeah, you know, you, you could have some great days when you're working with this. And it doesn't mean you could declare victory and go home because right. the next day something else is going to come up. You know, I, I guess if I look back over the duration of my career since 1981, so 40 plus years, um, if, if I if I got one thing, it's I've got the, the ability to judge the duration of what we've done over these last 43 or 44 years. And as I said, we're in a very good place now, I think. I think police officers and, and mental health practitioners 43 years ago probably were doing a wonderful job, but may not recognize the challenges today. And I say that about public school teachers, too. Um, things are so different. It's about adapting. It's about staying ahead of the curve and making sure we're doing everything we can and committing to it. And there's nothing wrong with celebrating what's been done, for sure, as, you, as you're kind of pointing out. But and yet. Anything can happen at any time, and it still doesn't mean that what you were doing was wrong. You, you know what I'm saying? I think that's the that's that's the struggle that you know that we have to put everything into real context, but knowing that we got to be doing what we're doing and and more even as we can for sure. Yeah, agree, hundred percent, Bill. All right, I'll leave it at that. Any closing thoughts from you, uh, Paul? No, just if I could just say, I never want to miss the opportunity to say how proud I am of the office and the staff here, our attorneys, our support staff, our juvenile justice team, our victim witness advocates, every single day coming to work. Uh, we are blessed in Essex County with a very, very talented team, and I'm proud of the work they're doing. Essex County District Attorney Paul Tucker, I'm Bill Newell, and this is MSONewsports.com.